Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to Javi Memorial Library virtual event. We are excited to have our partners back from Fort Hood today. Today we have Dustin Shuffler. Um, he is the Operations and Maintenance Division, well, the Occupational Health and Safety Specialist with the Operations and Maintenance Division, very long title. We also have Environmental Outreach Coordinator, Christine Luciano. <laughs> Welcome, guys. And we're going to be going ahead and learning about two different kinds of three R's today. So welcome, guys. Take it away. Good afternoon. So my name is Dustin Shuffler. Like you said, I'm the Occupational Health and Safety Specialist here on Fort Hood um, with the Director of um, Public Works. And so and I've been asked to come in today to speak with you all about the Army's 3R Explosive Safety Program. The Army realized that there's a need for awareness when in 2000, there was a case near Camp Shelby, Mississippi, where some teenagers removed some munitions from an operational range, even though warning signs and fences indicated that the range was off limits to the public and cautioned of these dangers. And so nevertheless, they um, entered and removed some of the munitions, passing them around for several days. Unfortunately though, one of them dropped one of the munitions and it reportedly struck the um, bumper of a pickup truck which resulted in the um, the death of a 16 year old boy and um, resulted in the injury of another child and so so that's when the army realized that they needed to stand up and establish three r's explosive safety program to um, to you know educate the military personnel their families and the surrounding communities and so okay. so powerpoint ready for the powerpoint yep are you ready for the powerpoint yes ma'am all right Okay. So going on with that, so unfortunately, though, people across the United States, they continue to find and handle munitions, you know, some being dated back all the way to Civil War era, and many of them are unaware that of the potential of the hazards that these munitions um, pose. Like in 2008, you know, a Civil War cannonball was detonated and killed a relic collector while he was collecting or while he was trying to remove black powder fill out of the cannonball. The explosion, though, was so great that um, pieces of the cannonball flew through the front porch of the um, nearby house almost a quarter mile away. And so, so, you know, live fire training, testing, and battlefield use have left um, military munitions and lands and waters throughout the United States. And many people find and keep these as souvenirs or keepsakes, placing themselves and others at risk unknowingly. You know, the three R's program that the Army designed to, um, has, was or designed to prevent such tra um, tragedies and um you know educate the you know personnel the families and you know like i said before the surrounding communities on these issues um so the three r's on my segment of this portion stands for recognize retreat and report and the three r's program like i said again and it, I'll, i'm gonna go ahead and um let you know up front i'll, I'll be repeating it many times throughout this um presentation but it, it's it was designed to inform the public on what they should do if they come across um, or suspect they may have come across a munition. And so, so we're going to start with the recognize when you may have, you need to recognize when you may have encountered a munition and that munitions are very, very dangerous. You need to retreat in stuff. So you do not need to approach these um, items. Don't touch them. Don't move them. Don't disturb them and carefully, retreat from the area that you entered the in the exact same way that you did the third r stands for report we want you to call 911 and advise the police of exactly what you've seen and exactly where you've seen it we want you to be aware that, um, of the dangers of munitions particularly uxos and what they pose and we want you to know the actions to take and stuff to protect yourselves your families your friends and your communities next slide please So, you know, going on, um, some might ask, so what is a munition? Um, well, this presentation particularly focuses on the DOD military munitions. However, the concepts also apply to foreign and commercial munitions. The term DOD military munitions is interchangeable with um, ammunition in stuff, which is an explosive. 
you know, military munitions may also be referred to ordinances or munitions. And some they also um, throughout this presentation, we're going to use the word munitions a whole lot. So we want you to uh, understand that there's other terms that can be used in other types of resource material, you know, describing munitions. But we're going to use munitions today. And so most music um, or most munitions are designed to kill, injure, damage equipment and um, damage buildings and stuff. So we we practice the training munitions may contain or, or Practice and training munitions may also contain, you know, a small propellant or explosive charge that can also be dangerous. Munitions come in many different shapes and sizes, and they can be small, like the small arms ammunition that um, you use at home or, you know, the military uses in rounds such as 50 cal and below, and which would be used in personal weapons like pistols and rifles. They could be small, medium, or large projectiles that are fired from mortars or tanks or artillery pieces. And they could also be bombs from aircrafts and stuff or missiles, rockets, or even, you know, around the naval areas, torpedoes. And so, so next slide. So now we're going to get into the question of what's a UXO. Well, UXO stands for unexploded ordnance and stuff. What is an unexploded ordnance? Well, a UXO um, is a munition or ammo that failed to function, failed to go off, you know, failed, failed to fire or whatnot. And so, and it can be of any type, you know, there may just be a component of that munition and stuff that's left behind, such as a fuse or um, exposed explosive fill left um, from that UXO. That's what call or that's what makes up an actual UXO. Next slide. Now we get into, you know, you might ask, you know, how do I identify? Well, some of them are very, very hard to identify. And so UXOs can be encountered anywhere. Although most of the time on military, um, most of your military munitions will most likely be encountered in areas that the military currently uses, such as operational range or tactical areas of operation. They can also be encountered, though, in areas once used or former ranges um, for live fire training or testing and also um, areas that were formerly used for um, tactical operations. An example of this is going to be, so back in Iraq, um, there was two soldiers that were cleaning up a front yard of their living area. And unfortunately they dug up a, a yellow pipe that was approximately about 10 inches long or so. And so this pipe had thick covering of dirt. Well, one of the soldiers grabbed it and attempted trying to remove the dirt by striking it against the wall. One, he did that, unfortunately, with this, same as the other scenarios, that um, munition or that um, UXO detonated and killed one of the soldiers and seriously injured the other one and stuff. And then once the um, once the EOD gets out there, they were able to determine that um, the function was actually uh, a submunition and stuff. And what they, you know, the ultimate um, cause of it was, you know, these soldiers didn't recognize that that was a, uh, UXO and stuff. So unfortunately left them the casualties involved. And so next slide. So just like, you know, identifying it and stuff, um, munitions are very, you know, they vary, very um, indifferent or, or in appearance. I'm sorry. And stuff, as you can see on this slide, you know, munitions um, are, are, different sizes, different shapes and stuff. And what we want you to know is you should never pick up anything that you know or suspect that might be a munition. In fact, it's best to not pick up anything that you might drop at all, you know, or, or that you didn't drop. I'm sorry, not that you might have dropped, but one that you didn't drop. You might you know, just don't don't grab it. If you didn't drop it, don't touch it and stuff. Munitions um, such as those pictured here, though, in this presentation vary in different um, ages, you know, condition. And consequently, like in the previous slide, they might be very hard to identify and stuff. So when we when we start talking a little bit more on the different types of appearances and stuff, like I said before, they come in different types and sizes. You know, some might look like a munition, like a projectile, grenade or bomb, and some might be completely buried in the dirt and stuff or vegetation or sand or type of material. 
that you can't tell what it is. Some of them might even be submerged in water. I mean, we got Belton Lake around here. You might find what you think is ammunition or it might look like ammunition washing up on the shoreline at Belton Lake. So if you see something like that, that that's the whole point in this presentation is we want you to recognize that, hey, it doesn't look normal. It looks like it could be something of danger. Let's not touch this thing. Let's not get around it. Let's call somebody, you know, that knows what it is and get, get them out here to take care of it. So, you know, we've already talked a little bit about the Civil War stuff, but in recent years, the Civil War items and munitions have claimed, you know, countless lives and stuff because people have taken those things home and utilized them for decoration. Um, munitions marked... I'm sorry. Munitions marked with the um, word simulator or practice on them, they don't need to be touched either because those items can be particularly dangerous and stuff as well as um you know small explosive charges and stuff that could come off from those so you know we just want you to know that if you think it might look like one if you have any kind of suspect feeling that it's ammunition or, or unexploded ordnance at all and stuff like we said recognize it get away from it and stuff and then call somebody that does know what they're um what they're dealing with to come in and examine it the eod our, you know, law enforcement personnel, I promise you, they're not going to get upset if they have to come out there and remove something that had nothing to do with the UXO or munition. If it's a valid concern by, you know, a military personnel, their family or concerned citizen out there, nobody's going to get upset with you for calling and doing the right things. Next slide. So in, in this slide, this is an example of a munition before use and after use. And in this picture particularly, we're looking at a 105 projectile. And on the bottom of this one, um, of, of this picture, shows the projectile that was fi or fired but um, failed to actually function as intended, causing it to become a UXO. And so, so when a UXO or when a 105 projectile detonates and stuff, metal piecements or fragments, as we like to call them around here, um, from the projectile body trial or travel at high speeds to distances up to, you know, over 1900 feet, which, you know, in Lame's terms is the length of six and a half football fields almost. So that's quite a big area that it covers um, and it can injure anybody within its path. That's why we want you to be very, very cautious about these type of items. Next slide. On this slide, so this is this one will show you two different styles of rockets, one that hasn't been fired and one that has been fired and has been used and laying out in the field for some time. Rockets, these particular ones right here, they um, consist of a rocket motor or an engine and stuff and a warhead. The rocket motor actually contains the propellant for the rocket that fuels it, um, that fuels the projectile and stuff and the warhead contains actual explosive that goes off. Upon detonation, um, either on use if, or if it's disturbed as a UXO, people need to be at least um, 1,420 feet away and stuff to be safe from the blast or fragments of this item, you know. And to give you that one, that's five football fields. you got to be clear at least five football fields away from one of these or you could be severely killed or injured. Next slide. So now we're going to, you know, get in a couple more scenarios or whatnot um, with this one in the next slide as well. But we're going to start talking about people that like to take and collect these munitions and stuff as souvenirs. These pose an extreme danger for you and your family and for the surrounding public. Um, souvenir munitions, um, even the Civil War cannonballs that may have been kept in a family and handled for years and years and years, those things can still be deadly. And we want everyone to know that if you've taken a munition, collected one as a souvenir, a keepsake, or a war trophy, it's okay. Call local law enforcement and get them on the phone and request EOD support so you can turn them in underneath the Fort Hood's amnesty program. Or you can take and um, have them placed in, uh, in the amnesty box located on Fort Hood, but you want that done by a professional, okay? You don't want to just start handling that again and take it out there and put it in that box yourself without letting somebody know. Call the EOD, get law enforcement involved. You'll be, you'll be okay. They'll come out and they'll take care of that for you if you've taken one home or, or maybe you've um, acquired one as a gift from a grandparent or something from the Civil War era type deal and stuff. Let's go ahead and try to get those things turned in the Fort Hood's amnesty program. Next slide. 
So right here in this slide, I want to give you just a, a really quick brief history on Fort Hood and its munitions usage real fast. Um, Fort Hood, as many of you know, was established as Camp Hood back in 1942. You know, it was the home of the Tank Destroyer, Tank Destroyer Tactical and Firing Center. When in 1950, it was renamed Fort Hood. Um, in 1954, Third Corps and Armed Corps established in 1918, which moved to Fort Hood as a um, supervised training of combat um, units. Uh, in 1956, the 1st and 2nd Armored Division trained recruits for Vietnam. And since the 1970s, Fort Hood has played a major role in the training, testing, and introduction of new equipment, tactics, and organizations for the military. Fort Hood is the largest active duty armored post in the United Armed Forces. And today alone, Fort Hood encompasses approximately um, 219,000 acres, with more than 196,000 of those acres being range and training areas for, the, um, for our soldiers. These training areas consist of 75 small arms ranges, 11 multi-purpose vehicle and tank ranges, 10 urban um, training areas, and two underground training facilities. These facilities support hundreds of our Stryker, Bradley vehicles, um, Abrams tanks, aircraft, and provide state-of-the-art training opportunities for mechanized maneuvers, small training exercises, and combined arms training and live fire training for our warfighters. Next slide. Munition and counter areas. So this is where munitions can be encountered anywhere. And so although military munitions are most likely going to be encountered in areas that, um, that the military currently uses, such as operational ranges, tactical areas, and areas of operations, they may also be encountered in areas used once for live fire training areas um, that have been converted to recreational areas um, to include former training areas. So you know, developments for um, industrial residential purposes, you know, those there's been instances where we, you know, we've converted those over um, or converted over those type of usage for um, training or for the areas of use. So for this reason, it's important to know that your surrounding um, surroundings or to know of your surroundings, where you're located and stuff, especially being around Fort Hood and understand that if you're in any area, that may have a higher chance to um, encounter munitions, know kind of what to look for, um, which is where we're going to get going into the next slide. Um, it's it's very, very, very critical that you heed any posted warning signs. Next slide. So, yep. So right in this slide and, and in slide 12, we're, we'll talk about like how the gates and signs and stuff um, that you'll see, you'll see a bunch of different signage and um, verbiage posted along gates. And um, if you see fences up in areas surrounding Fort Hood or on Fort Hood, hey, know that you don't need to cross those areas. You don't need to be in, you know, inside the vicinity of those fence lines and stuff because there's probably something very dangerous and something very hazardous involved um, in going in those areas. There's, uh, you know, we want you to know that even former installation property still has, you know, signs and verbiage up that still needs to be respected and, and listened to. Um, next slide. So these are the different examples of some warning signs that you might see. You'll see the danger. You'll see the stop. You'll see, you know, the, the big fences. Uh, that's that's the tall tale sign. You don't need to be in there. If there's a fence on there, if there's a gate that's on there and it's a locked area, period. Even if it's not locked and it's a sign posted, don't don't trespass into those areas. Stay out of them. It's for your safety and that's why they're posted up there. Next slide. So really fast, I wanted to give you one example of some of something that did happen though when um a couple of individuals in 2012 five men actually trespassed onto another military installation where once again like i said in some of the previous um information you know signs and verbiage was posted it was ignored and stuff and they were in there to collect metal items um one of them was handling a piece of the metal item when it exploded and badly injured that guy and you know took out one of his eyes and crushed some of the bones in his hands and stuff so you know that's just one example that you know getting out there in those ranges and picking up things that you think could, you know, turn in for some money or something like that, that 
we don't need to do that. And it's very dangerous and stuff. So with this slide right here in slide 13, let's talk about, you know, the three R's and, uh, you know, a little bit more in depth on what exactly they mean and um, whatnot. Um, so what do you do if you encounter ammunition outside of a DOD management system? You're going to follow the three R's just as you would if you encountered one on the DOD military installation. You need to recognize that you may have encountered ammunition and that munitions are very dangerous. You need to retreat and stuff. Like, so you do not need to approach. You don't need to touch. You don't need to disturb it. You need to be careful. You need to leave the area and you need to try to, and we emphasize this portion, when you go to leave that area, try to leave in the exact same manner in which you entered because you don't know if you start getting off track from the way you did enter, you might trip something, step on something, cause something to go off and stuff. That, you know, we don't want nothing like that to happen to you. The third R, once again, is you need to report it. You need to call 911 and you need to advise the police on what you saw, where you saw it. And the first step, though, is to recognize that um, munition. You need to, even if it's a small explosive device, a simulator, you need to recognize what you see and you need to recognize that there's severity of injuries that could be involved with touching that item or picking, you know, picking it up, moving it around. Um, you need to remember that munitions might not be easy to recognize. We've already gone over that. You know, it could be covered up in dirt. It could be aged. It could be an old Civil War cannonball, like we've said countless times already. It could be something of that nature. You need to realize that <clears throat> these items are very dangerous. They could be deadly. Next slide. So second R and stuff, and I'm sure you already know it. You're probably saying it with me right now is re retreat. And that one, like I said, very, very important. Don't touch it. Don't move it. Don't disturb it carefully leave the area the exact same way that you went in. And so I'll say it again before this presentation's over on the retreat portion. If you walked in one way, walk back out that exact same way. You, you don't know the importance of it until, until you really see the substantial damage that could happen if you accidentally trip off something inside one of those areas, um, especially once you've recognized that you've seen a munition laying in one of those areas. Um, next slide. Last one's report it. I think that's kind of a given. Everybody knows, you know, let's call 911. Absolutely. Call 911. Get a hold of the authorities. Let them know exactly where you've seen this item. If you can, try to mark it somehow on a map or something like that. Or, or you know, once you've established that you've gotten out of the area where that munition is and you're no longer in any kind of danger, mark the area right where you are immediately there as well. And stuff, so you can get those authorities right to that area to get in there and, and so they can detect whether it is an you know, explosive UXO or if it's not. Um, like I said before, if you come across anything that looks like one of these items or that might look dangerous, remember the three R's. And so you need to recognize it, retreat from it, and report. Next slide. So in summary, you know, we're going to say it again, munitions, including the UXOs, they all come in different shapes and sizes. Remember that. Put it in your head. You know, the old pineapple grenades, even though they get old and rusty, you know, they can still hold explosives. Those are still very, very dangerous. So remember, you know, you, the, all munitions are designed to kill, injure, and destroy property of some sort. They're not designed to be your friend. They're designed to do one thing, kill, injure, destroy. That's it. Um, because of this, you know, I think that's pretty obvious that, um, munitions are dangerous, but don't take in, um, take out of account that, you know, the fuses on these things could be just as dangerous. You know, they hold the charge as well, and they could cause just as much da uh, damage to a person or to include death as, as the actual munition themselves. And so, so don't assume that just because it's a fuse, it's safe. You know, if, even if it's a fuse detonation cord, we found that, you know, at the wash racks on Fort Hood, the unit will come with a, um, and have some, uh, it, a practice deck cord is what it is and so for what it was and left it on, you know, one of the, um, units out there at the wash rack accidentally. And, you know, we had to go out there and get EOD and said, so they come out and they clear it. Hey, it's just deck cord, but you know what? I'm glad somebody recognized that that was a danger, that it could have been something that could have went off and stuff because it very well could have, it could have hurt somebody extremely bad. Remember also that if you or someone else encounters anything that might be ammunition of any sort, a UXO and stuff, 
remind your kids, remind your spouses, remind your friends and stuff of the three R's to recognize it, report or retreat and to report those items. Um, with this, this pretty much sums up my entire presentation, but I do want to tell you if there's any more information that you'd like to review, or if you want to get your kids involved in on the three R's program. And so some might ask, why would I want to get my kids involved on the three R's? Well, you know, UXOs have been found in our area, Temple, Texas, matter of fact, um, in the last year or so uh, at a playground area. And somebody actually took it home. They got the EOD out there. And it was a, it was actually a live UXO that EOD was able to remove and nobody got hurt. Thank God. You know, we're, we're, we're grateful for that. Nobody got hurt. But, you know, if you want to get your kids involved in it where they can learn some, this website at the bottom bottom of this page right here, the denix.osd.mil forward slash UXO forward slash, they got all kinds of information. They got activity pads for kids to get on and stuff and involved in and where they can play games. They can actually do a recognized report retreat or um, recognized retreat report right there online. And um, we got a mascot on there as a dog and stuff it, that could keep those kids involved a little bit to help, you know, bring their awareness to it too. So it's not just for adults. It's not just for military personnel. We need to, you know, really, really emphasize with the children out, especially in the Fort Hood area, Coppers Cove, Colleen, you know, Salado, Belton, all these different areas where we go and we um, recreate outdoors that there is a possibility because of the training installation that we live next to Fort Hood they could come across munition at any time. So that's the that's the three R's program for the explosive safety um, portion of this. Uh, let me ask you a question really quick. Do you know what the three R stands for after me going over this with y'all? Recognize, retreat, and report. There you go. I appreciate that. That's awesome. I'm going to turn it over I, to Christine real fast. Well, um, Dustin, I have a question uh -huh. real quick. Yeah, if, absolutely. Um, You said that this is, you know, where Fort Hood is now. Mm -hmm. Is there any record anywhere of where Fort Hood used to be? Because, you know, Fort Hood surrounds Colleen. So, like, is is there are there maps of where there's a possibility, like Lake Belton or somewhere, there's, you know, more chance to look for these things? Not so, look for them, but, you know, be aware of it. Fort Hood's done a really, really good job uh, as far as we have a um, we have live fire area out there and it's permanently dudded. Um, that area out there is actually marked off. Every area on Fort Hood, we got a map for and we actually in DPW director that works. We have a system, the GIS system, and they keep an accurate record of all our maps of Fort Hood at all times, dating back to when Fort Hood started to everything that might change to a building that might get a new component installed or anything like that. It's uh, located at the um, in our GS our GIS department there in Director of Public Works. So yes, we do have maps and stuff. I don't um, necessarily know that all the maps that we do contain in the GIS are a public file, but I do know that for areas of recreation where people are allowed to go and, uh, or, you know, visit on Fort Hood, we do have maps available for those people out there. Um, just know, you know, like I said before in this, um, just because the live fire area might not necessarily butt right up against Lake Belton, we do have a major creek that flows through and stuff that feeds Lake Belton and stuff like the Cowhouse Creek, the Leon River, different um, sub, you know, sub creeks that feed off and um, branch off into Belton Lake. So, there's, you know, there's possibility for munitions and UXOs and stuff to be in those creeks and stuff like that and get washed down with floods and stuff. So that's why the three R's program is so important for them to realize that they need to recognize these items. They need to retreat and they need to report them so that if they do find something like that, have, you know, heaven forbid they're out there boating on the weekend with their family. They know what to look for. Uh, I, you know, a lot of people think that this is just a yearly training that the military has to do all the time. It is a part of their training that they do have to do, but it's very important that they, you know, they pay attention and they take this information and pass it along to their loved ones at home as well, because our community, not everybody is related to Fort Hood like we are, you know, so getting out there in the general public and having them aware of these types of programs will help them people as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank yes, you so much, Dustin. Yes, ma'am. All right. So hello, everybody. My name is Christine Luciano. Next slide, please. So, you know, we talked about the three R's in regards to safety to recognize, um, 
retreat. Retreat. <laughs> Report. Sorry. So you know, it, you know, we've had a strong partnership with the safety program with environmental that you know, educating military families and also our good neighbors outside of Fort Hood is important. So as you know, it's summertime and we're exploring and we're getting out. And as Dustin said, we have Lake Belton. We have a lot of recreation areas where there is nearby training. And as we get out there, we want you to think about the environment and the three R's. You know, we teach our youth and our children to reduce, reuse, and recycle. And that also relates to a program called Leave No Trace. So, you know, how many of you have taken a hike, been on a picnic, gone camping with your family or friends? You know, this is a great time to get outside, to renew your spirits, and just connect with nature. You know, there's many natural wonders out of the world, a lot of local parks, state parks to explore. So Leave No Trace is the most widely accepted outdoor ethics program used on public lands. And it's dedicated to protecting the outdoor spaces by teaching and inspiring people people of all ages to enjoy it responsibly. So as an environmental outreach coordinator with the Director of Public Works, I would like to take this opportunity to emphasize, you know, there are seven principles and why the importance of leave no traces message. Next slide. So each of us plays a vital role in protecting our outdoor space. And as summer has arrived, we spend time outdoors in the natural world and in the wilderness. And it's important to be conscious of the effects of our actions every day and how that may impact plants, animals, other people, and even entire ecosystems. The National Park System includes 423 areas covering more than 85 million acres. So that's such a large footprint. These areas include national parks, monuments, and even battlefields, as Dustin shared about Civil War um, you know, items and munitions that you have might encounter. Military parks, historical parks, historic sites, lake shores, recreation areas, rivers, and trails. Last year, there were 297 million recreation visitors to national parks. So there's a high probability that they might encounter something similar to a UXO. So we just, like he said, go back to the three R's to not touch it, especially if you don't know, uh, if you suspect it's something and that can cause potential danger. So as the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department oversees more than 640,000 acres of land in Texas, including more than 90 state parks and natural areas. So, you know, as we explore the outdoors, following the leave no trace principles can help us to minimize our impacts and they can be applied anywhere, anytime while taking part in recreational activities. Next slide. So why is Leave No Trace the best way to minimize impacts in the outdoors? Well, you know, nine out of 10 people who visit the outdoors are not informed about the Leave No Trace message. With over 13 billion trips into the outdoors in the U.S. alone every year, people are causing much preventable damage, and that damage is adding up. You know, we go explore local areas, national areas, and you, you will go to an area and you'll see an area that's been trashed, um, that's exposed to quite a bit of litter sometimes. You have fire scars at a campground, severely damaged trails and other impacts. And so here's some statistics, some facts that I just kind of want to share to give you more of a, the larger impact um, of those actions. So Americans pay $2.9 billion to fight fires in parks and forests, 80% of which are caused by campfires left intended, the burning of debris, or, you know, discarded cigarettes. Wildlife in our parks are routinely relocated and in some cases euthanized due to conflicts with humans. And the National Park Service cites human garbage as the origin of many of these unfortunate and unnecessary conflicts. Wildlife can obtain human food and can lose their fear of humans, develop attraction to behaviors to trails, picnic areas, campsites, and visitors. And so you're turning these wild animals into aggressive and potentially dangerous panhandlers. Also, invasive species are being spread nationwide due to moving firewood from one area to the next by campers. Uh, we're also seeing challenges at 
uh, with boats and, you know, as we go out to the lakes, uh, a challenge in Texas has been zebra mussels, um, you know, and you want to leave no trace. Uh, litter has been a challenge and we'll get into some litter facts for the state of Texas, but trash lasts a very long time. Just don't think, hey, I'm going to throw it out. I'm going to leave it here. Someone's going to pick it up. It'll just disappear in a couple of days. No, plastic grocery bags can last up to 20 years. Aluminum cans can last up to 100 years. And fishing line can last up to 600 years. Just a couple of months ago, I was at the Miller Springs Nature Center in Belton, and we were doing a trash cleanup with a group of high school students. And we went to some areas where we found cans and glass bottles that were thrown 60 years ago, 60 years ago. You know, the, the cans looked a little rusted out. Otherwise, it was pretty visible of what that material was, um, the signage and everything. And of course, you know, glass, they say, can take a million years for that to, to break down. So we have to, to be conscious of our everyday decisions and what those impacts can be. So leave no trace is the best way to minimize these and other types of impacts that we see in the outdoors today. You can be on the forefront of changing that troubling trend, the trash parks, damaged trails, and polluted waterways. So each of us plays a critical role in both community stewardship and also environmental stewardship. Next slide. So the impacts, you know, the impacts of our actions from outdoor recreation affect wildlife and soil. So there's several different broad areas. You have wildlife impacts where you can alter behavior. Um, you know, you can reduce the health of those animals. Wildlife should just be that wild. You know, providing access to human food or even approaching them too closely is harmful uh, to people. And we, fortunately, we see those videos on social media and, you know, they can be, um, the result can be deadly in the end. So it's not worth the risk. There's also soil impacts that you might have um, due to loss of organic litter, soil erosion, even trail erosion can be permanently alter the landscape. And it's preventable when people adopt the no, leave no trace principles. You have cultural resource impacts through theft or damage to cultural or historic features and artifacts at these state and national parks. Um, the campfire impacts, as we said, there are large damaging fires. And as we're seeing changes with the climate and droughts, you know, the, the impact is becoming more severe. So careless actions such as leaving campfires unattended or discarding cigarettes are most, some of the most common causes of destructive wildfires that are leading to billion dollar losses and death of people and wildlife. And there's also water resource impacts um, from you know, soap and fecal waste and water is a precious resource for all of us. So we all just need to do our part. And then there's social impacts from other visitors. Um, as we're seeing individuals exploring more outdoors and we're seeing um, the after the COVID-19 experience and getting out and wanting to be outdoors and explore, um, you're getting more folks outside into these parks. And in some areas, there's quite a bit of overcrowding um, and those cumulative impacts uh, can have can compound on that. So next slide. So we're going to show you just just a slide, a couple slides, just to give you just a visual. So you have this nice grassy park area. Um, it's easy to access to water. You've got trees and it's gorgeous. You want to be outdoors because it's nice and cool. Next slide. But, you know, as we get more folks out there, um, you know, people come out, they have a picnic, they're out with their family, their friends, and those recreation related impacts can increase significantly. So we see families out here, we see folks that might be in the water, uh, we see litter that's kind of spread out. And unfortunately, that's the reality that we see in some of these outdoor spaces. So next slide. So we want to talk a little bit about some trash talk. So here's some, some interesting facts from Don't Mess With Texas. And they do a litter survey, um, especially a lot of the Keep Texas Beautiful affiliates. We have several here in the area um, from Copper's Cove, Salado, and Gatesville. And they do an assessment of their footprints to see um, through education, through outreach, if there's been an increase or decrease of litter. And, you know, it's, it's 
I'm fortunate, you know, litter has been a continuous challenge. And here's just some, some facts I want to share that approximately 435 million pieces of visible litter accumulates on Texas roadways annually. And that is significant. So, you know, 71% of litter consists of micro litter. So those are those tiny pieces of litter from straws to gum wrappers to cigarette butts. Don't think after you smoke something or after you chew a piece of gum, if you just throw out the window, it's going to disappear. It doesn't. That accumulates. And to think that together with those, those negative actions that more than 500,000 cigarette butts are deposited on Texas roadways each year. So, you know, we want you to be conscious, do your part to help out with the environment. Next slide. So, you know, think of Leave No Trace as a spectrum. You know, on one end, you have many impacts where you have quite a bit of letter. And then on the other end, you have few impacts because you're doing your part and following those seven principles. So, you know, many ways leave no trace when spending time outdoors, find your place in the spectrum, do anything that you can do to minimize your impact. Um, doing something is better than nothing. It's about doing what you can do on natural spaces and choosing to spend time to pack out your trash. You've left no trace. Make sure you pick up after your waste. And the misconception is, oh, my dog poops. It's natural fertilizer. No, that is harmful. And that's a pollutant that can impact our streams, our lakes, our waterways. So, you know, do your part. And this cumulative effect um, helps promote good stewardship actions. And collectively, we can all do our part. So think of the difference our public lands if everyone just did their part and took it into action. Next slide. So we're going to go over the, the seven principles of leave no trace. So the first principle, it's a plan ahead and a prepare. And this, you know, aligns with the safety message. You know, it, it helps ensure safety of groups, of individuals. It prepares you to minimize any type of resource damage. And it contributes to accomplishing trip goals safely and enjoyably. So you increase self-confidence and opportunities for learning more about nature. Uh, poor planning can result in miserable um, damage from natural to cultural resor resources. So do your part to become smart, to get educated, know the regulations and special concerns for an area you're visiting, prepare for extreme weather, hazards and emergencies. And we've seen significant changes in weather, especially here in Texas. It can be sunny one moment and the next thing you know, it's raining and there's hail damage and a potential tornado. So, you know, just keep your eye on the weather. Um, schedule your trip to avoid times of high use and visit in small groups when possible. Consider splitting larger groups so you have smaller impacts. Um, and then use a map, a compass, use those tools right there, GPS, to help um, be safe on your, your, your journey and as you explore trails. The second principle is to travel and camp on durable surfaces. You know, concentrating travel on trails reduces the likelihood that multiple routes will develop, scar the landscape, and it's better to have one well-designed route than many poorly chosen paths. So travel damage occurs when surface vegetation or communities of organisms are trampled beyond recovery. So the result is barren areas that leads to soil erosion and the development of undesirable trails. So we can minimize our impact um, when we're planning out our trip is to use durable surfaces, including maintained trails and designated campsites, um, protect riparian areas by camping at least 200 feet from lakes and streams, and good campsites are found not made. So try to avoid altering a site um, if you can. So, you know, in popular, popular areas, concentrate use of existing trails, walk single file in the middle of the trail, and keep campsites small. The third principle is to dispose of waste properly. It's important to avoid pollution of water resources, avoid the negative implications of someone else finding ways and minimize the possibility of spreading disease and maximize the rate of decom decomposition. So, you know, as we said, what the litter, the trash that we leave behind does not disappear. It could take years, decades, even hundreds of years for it to decompose. So each of us has a responsibility to clean up before we leave an area. 
So help by remembering to pack it in, pack it out, inspect your campsite, food preparation areas, and rest areas for trash or spilled foods, um, pack out toilet paper and hygiene products, bring bags for pet waste, and dispose of those bags in designated areas. So do your part. Next slide. So the fourth principle is to leave what you find. Now allow in others a sense of discovery by leaving rocks, plants, and other objects of interest that you can come across, especially cultural artifacts, which are protected by the Archaeological Resources Protection Act. So it's illegal to move or disturb archaeological sites, historic sites, and artifacts such as arrowhead structures and even antique bottles found on public lands. So do your part to preserve the past, examine, photograph, but do not touch cultural or historical structures or artifacts, avoid introducing or transporting non-native species, and do not build uh, or dig trenches. The fifth principle is to minimize campfire impacts. Now, as we shared multiple times is that campfires can cause lasting impacts in the environment. So, you know, use a lightweight stove for cooking, um, enjoy a candle lantern for light, and where fires are permitted, use established fire rings and keep fires small. The sixth principle is to respect wildlife. Learn about wildlife through a quiet observation. Do not disturb wildlife or plants for just a better look. Uh, you know, observe them from a distance. Don't follow or approach them. Never feed animals. Uh, feeding wildlife damages their health, alters natural behaviors, and exposes them to predators and other dangers. So do your part to protect wildlife and your food by storing rations and trash securely, control pets at all times, or leave them at home and avoid wildlife during sensitive times, such as mating, nesting, raising young, or winter. And the last principle, the seventh principle, is to be considerate of other visitors. One of the most important components of outdoor ethics is to maintain courtesy toward our visitors. You know, it helps everybody enjoy their outdoor experience. Many come to the outdoors to listen to nature, excessive noise, uncontrolled pets, and damaged surroundings take away from that natural appeal of the outdoors. So do your part to respect other visitors and protect the quality of their experience. Be courtesy, uh, courteous, yield to others, on the trails, step to the downhill side of a trail when encountering uh, packed stock, take breaks and camp away from trails and other visitors, and let nature sounds prevail. Next slide. So, you know, it just coming back to it, it takes all of us. As Destin share, you know, the messages that we're sharing, it's not something that's for one target group. This applies to uh, soldiers, to civilians, to families, to individuals of all ages um, that we can all do our part in leading away with the three R's of safety and also the environment. Any more? And that concludes my presentation, all our right. presentation. All righty. All right. Well, let me see first. Let me check with Alyssa to see if we have any questions on that. She will let us know. Um, I have a question while she's looking to see if we have any questions. Um, you made me feel guilty about feeding birds. So we probably should not feed birds in our backyard, correct? <laughs> well, you know, we have a lot of birders in the area. You know, if you're, you're feeding birds and we have bird houses, you know, this is the time where birds are migrating through the area. Um, so, you know, get the proper seed mix out there. Don't give them bread. Nice. That causes quite a bit of damage to birds and ducks. Uh, you know, a lot of people, we have the, the pond right here at CTC and a lot of folks go out there and that can actually inhibit their flight and, and their development. So, you know, you have, uh, as they're migrating through the area, you know, you're, you're enjoying the area in your backyard. Uh, and there's a lot of initiatives also with citizen science organizations. Um, you have the um, backyard birding event that happens in February. In December is the Christmas bird count, and that's the longest citizen science uh, running event with the Audubon Society. So there are opportunities where you engage nature, but you want to just make sure you're doing it the right way. Well, and um, I've I've been to like Lake Belton, and there are those little fossils 
the you know the the little circle fossil things like everywhere over there and we had um a professor archaeology professor talk about you can just go anywhere like just pull off on the side of a road around here and the rock is just filled with fossils so um you're saying just leave everything just take a picture of it and move on yeah just observe it photograph it and just leave it there for others to enjoy that experience you know there's been years where we've seen severe droughts at Belton Lake and we see the old homestead sites. And we've actually hosted um, some of our Texas Archaeology Month, our field trips out there with our Fort Hood archaeologists. So, you know, it's an opportunity for visitors um, from Fort Hood and from outside Fort Hood to kind of see those artifacts and we educate them, but we leave it right back where it was found. Yeah, that's that's good. I've I've not seen a lot of wildlife, I guess, because there's so much um, built around here where I've seen more wildlife in different areas. Um, would you say that um, it's just packed around here or just in the parks? Or? So I would say, you know, um, a part of our education component, it's also about urban wildlife. And when people think, well, what do you mean by urban wildlife, city wildlife? What is that? You know, urban wildlife is a variety of wildlife um, from foxes to rabbits to snakes um, to raccoons that you'll see in this area. And, and those are also wildlife that you would see um, in these parks. So uh, we have a group of biologists on Fort Hood that also work with community partners that if there is an incident, whether in family housing or in the motor pool, that our team is out there to kind of assess and assist those soldiers and families um, when they do encounter something with urban wildlife. And, and just the same message, if you, if you see something that doesn't look right, you know, there are resources to contact individuals because we don't want anyone to get harm. Um, so, you know, just leave it alone and just report it. And, you know, and, and going back to what you said about the artifacts, um, and items that you might see, it's like take only photos and leave only footprints. That That's good advice. And um, I, I, I have lived in areas that has had a lot of wildlife, you know, in my attic and <laughs> my backyard. <laughs> so yeah, I don't touch anything. It's like back away, back away. So, well, it looks like um, there's no questions at this time. Um, do y'all want to say any final notes about anything, um, you know, to leave our viewers with, um, you know, you, you've given us so much information. Um, any last words? Sounds so ominous. Recognize, retreat, report. <laughs> and leave no trace and leave only footprints. Awesome. Awesome. You guys are, are amazing. Um, the amount of knowledge that is coming from your department is just unreal. And we want to remind everyone that we are going to continue to work with partner with Fort Hood um, on all types of subjects this year, um, from butterflies to birds to archaeology um, and Water, Even prescribed water. fires and everything that's coming up you know, later in the fall. So, yes, the, you know, we have uh, a great team within several different fields. So we're really excited to share the knowledge of the environmental umbrella and also work with our community partners just to get awareness out, too. So thank that's you for awesome. this opportunity to not only educate students and community members here at main campus at Central Texas College, but overseas, too. So this is an excellent yeah. education opportunity. Awesome. Well, we're great. I'm looking forward to your prescribed burns because when I first moved here, I just thought the entire place was was burning up. I'm like, whoa, there's a major fire happening. And my daughter's like, no, 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 no. You're good. You're OK. So, well, before we go, um, I just want to remind everyone that on June 22nd, we have a photo walk with Professor Andrada. Make sure that you um, look at our events calendar, see where you need to register for that event, because um, we're going to be walking around campus with the professor, bring a camera or your phone or whatever, and we will learn all kind of amazing things on how to take awesome photographs. We were originally going to live stream it, but um, 
we between walking from one place to another, it's a lot of jog, jogging of our camera and we didn't want to make anybody seasick. So we're going to do the actual photo walk and then we're going to upload the stream after on that one. Plus, we also have CTC astronomer Warren Hart and it will be on June 29th. He's coming back to tell us about our night sky tour for July. So if we haven't made you guys um, astronomers yet, you're just not paying attention. Uh, so, so definitely join us for those as well. Uh, Christine, Dustin, thank you very much for taking time out today to um, talk with us. We're very excited and we look forward to another one of you guys' um, programs with us. So. You guys, y'all have a great day. Everybody at CTC, um, yeah, go find some AC. It's kind of hot today. <laughs> so, thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. We'll see y'all later. So, Alyssa.